Good day. The submarine deal between the United States, Britain and Australia and the announcement of AUKUS, the new alliance or system of alliances or a partnership that Britain, Australia and the United States have created in the Pacific has provoked uproar, not so much as it turns out in China, the country against whom this project is directed against, but in France, the country which, of course, the United States claims to value as an ally and which is a key ally of the United States and which, as French politicians and spokesmen, have pointedly reminded the United States over the last few days is actually the United States' oldest ally. After all, as all Americans know, France intervened during the American War of Independence on the side of the United States. General Lafayette came and fought alongside the Americans, as did the French army, against the British. And, of course, the French fleet played a critical role in defeating the Royal Navy, making the eventual American victory in Yorktown, if not possible, at least much easier. So the French when they point out that they are America's oldest ally, are telling nothing less than the truth. Moreover, it's also been true to say that through most of the 19th and 20th centuries, French-American relations were very strong. The French, after all, were the people who gifted to the United States the Statue of Liberty, which you see in New York, and, of course, France as a sister republic of the United States, has often considered itself or conceived of itself as America's closest ally. In reality, the United States, since the Second World War, has had closer allies in Europe than France, one being, of course, Britain, with whom it fought the Second World War and with which it shares a common language, and increasingly in recent years, Germany, which to French chagrin is today the most powerful country economically and politically in Europe, apart, that is, of course, from Russia. So this has been one particular factor, undoubtedly, in angering the French, the fact that once again, the United States has demonstrated that France, despite the long history of its friendship with the United States, is actually a less important country to the United States than some other countries, notably Britain, Germany, and of course now Australia. But of course it does go beyond this. And here one has to understand certain current realities. The first is that France, of course, like other European countries, is becoming increasingly nervous by the reorientation of US policy away from Europe and with its focus instead on the Pacific. And that causes many people in France, and not just in France, to start to worry about France's importance in the overall strategic contest in the world. After all, during the Cold War, the conflict between the great powers, in those days the United States and the Soviet Union, was principally played out in Europe. Germany, though obviously the important country, one with a bigger economy than France, was also the battleground and it was divided. France had a critically important role to play and French leaders like Charles de Gaulle and François Mitterrand were able to make the most of that in order to win for France an important role in world and indeed Western affairs. Now, with the United States increasingly focusing on its duel with the Pacific, the French sense and feel that Europe is becoming less important to the United States and also less important in respect of uh, the role of France. And that is a profound shock for a French political establishment that still considers France to be, 
or, or, or feels that it should be, if not quite perhaps a great power, at least an important power in the world stage. And then, of course, there are the specific facts about this particular deal, which has annoyed the French intensely. First of all, the French had agreed to supply submarine technology to Australia. This is a long-standing deal, one which goes back many years, one in which the French have or claim to have particular expertise. And, of course, the submarines that they were going to supply to Australia, the Barracuda class, are themselves a evolution or a development of French nuclear-powered submarines, which France might have been in a position to sell to Australia had Australia asked for them. In those days, of course, the Australians did not seem to be interested in nuclear-powered submarines. Instead, they preferred conventionally-powered submarines because in those days the Australians were careful about taking on the trappings of what might be called a nuclear power by acquiring and deploying weapon systems, nuclear submarines, that use in some form nuclear technology. So there was never any question of Australia buying nuclear-powered submarines from France. They elected to buy conventionally-powered submarines from France. But the option, in theory, to buy nuclear-powered submarines from France was always there. And that leads to a particular issue, a particular point that the French have about this deal. Because not only does it amount to a repudiation of this deal by the Australians, a repudiation of a deal which Prime Minister Morrison reaffirmed only two months ago, but it also shows the Australians preferring technology, nuclear technology, from the United States and Britain to nuclear technology which might have been provided by France. I say that because if there had been a genuine interest on the part of the Australians for nuclear technology, if it had been simply a question of Australia deciding for itself that it needed nuclear-powered submarines, it could have negotiated with, with France to upgrade the existing submarine deal so that France supplied to Australia nuclear-powered submarines instead of conventionally-powered submarines. That would have been a relatively straightforward thing to do, given that the submarine design which the Australians were buying was, as I have said, an adaption of a French nuclear-powered submarine design. Instead, the Australians chose to buy their nuclear-powered submarines from Britain and from the United States, or at least the technology to build them. And that tells the French two things. Firstly, it tells the French that the Australians prefer American and British nuclear-powered submarine technology to, the, to French technology, and secondly, and perhaps more importantly, that when it comes to the great grand strategic issues, Australia prefers to align itself with the, uh, its other English-speaking allies, the United States and Britain. And that, of course, is a very hard thing for the French to accept. Now, France, by the way, is also a Pacific power. There are French uh, uh, islands, in the, or at least French-controlled islands in the Pacific. The French might feel and expect that as a NATO ally, they would at least have been consulted by the British, the Australians and the United States over this issue and would have been consulted about the fact that AUKUS was being uh, developed and was going to be set up. And they must feel again that the fact that they were not consulted, that they were not even informed about it, that they learnt about it entirely from the newspapers and from the public announcements of these three governments, and about the fact that the United States 
Britain and Australia have just pushed aside the deal that France thought it had with Australia. That has confirmed to the French a long-standing suspicion that the French have had ever since the Second World War, which is that there is an Anglophone alliance system and that the United States ultimately does not see its allies as equal allies, but treats its allies differently, with the United States always and invariably ultimately preferring English-speaking allies to allies that speak other languages. And that has told the French that the United States does not see them as the kind of ally that the French imagined that they were. So all of this is a big blow to France. It is a blow in terms of French uh, prestige, or uh, shall I say French self-esteem. It downgrades France's importance as a Pacific power. And of course, it reminds the French that the Americans will always in the end stick by their English-speaking allies ahead of all, its, all their other allies and that ultimately their interest in Europe and ultimately in France is diminishing as well. And of course, not to be underestimated, from the French point of view, they have lost a large amount of money on this deal. The probability is that the Australians will pay them a certain amount of money in compensation, but they're unlikely to get the full amount that they were expecting from the submarine deal. And of course, the bigger issue is that the French undoubtedly were looking and hoping and expecting that the submarine deal would one day lead to more things, that it would result in a deep cooperation between France and Australia, perhaps with Australia buying fighter jets like the Rafale fighter jet from France, and developing its military technologies, or at least some of its core military technologies, in collaboration with France. And that prospect, which for the French would have been an enticing one, um, arms exports being an important export item for the French economy, and also an important uh, um, instrument of influence for France, all that has now turned to dust, and the French, perhaps unsurprisingly, are now very bitter about it. But where will this go? What will the French do? Well, they highlighted their anger by doing something which, by the way, and interestingly, the Chinese, who are the presumed target of this new uh, AUKUS alliance, have not done. The French have recalled their ambassadors from Washington and Canberra, for urgent consultations. Now, that is a big step, by the way. Countries do not normally recall their ambassadors unless they are extremely angry and unless they feel that their relations, their relations uh, are now at a point of crisis. When the Russians recalled their ambassador for consultations after um, um, uh, President Biden inadvertently in an interview said that he agreed with the description of President Putin as a killer, it was a very strong sign of the Russian belief that relations with the United States were on a severe slide. And as I previously discussed, the Russians put what eventually proved to be overwhelming pressure on the United States to recall its own ambassador from Moscow. So recalling ambassadors in terms of diplomatic action is very high up in terms of the severe and important nature of diplomatic action. Having said that, it's also a symbolic step. And now the bigger question is what are the French going to do beyond this? And indeed, are they going to do anything? Are they simply going to say, well, we're not going to, uh, we're going to recall our ambassador, we're going to have urgent consultations, but in a few weeks' time, when tempers die down, well, things will be back to normal, 
and we're getting all these assurances from the United States, from the administration, that we're still valued as an ally, and the Australians, by the way, are saying the same thing, and we'll accept these assurances, and we'll move on. Is that what the French think, and what the French are going to do? Well, I'm going to say straight away that I predict, and in fact I am absolutely sure, that the British, the Americans and the Australians all expect that, that they all assume that this is just a temper tantrum from Paris, perhaps influenced by the pressures on President Macron in, uh, in anticipation of what it looks like to be a difficult election next year, and that they can disregard it, and that sooner or later the French will come round uh, accepting whatever emollient words come to them from Washington. And that is perhaps the most likely thing that is going to happen. Because from a French point of view, one does wonder whether the French really do have the stomach for further escalation. But I have to say that at the moment, this is perhaps going um, um, a little further with the French than perhaps people understand. The French at the moment do seem to be extremely angry. And, for example, we've had comments like a comment from Pierre Morcos, who is a visiting fellow at the at Washington Centre for Strategic and International Studies. And he said that the French move is historic, and he said that reassuring words, such as those heard yesterday from Secretary Blinken, are not enough for Paris, especially after French authorities learnt that the agreement was months in the making, with the implication being that it was concealed from France. So the French might be minded to take this further than they're saying. And if they do, what might they do? Well, there's been various discussions, there's been various topics, there's an editorial in the Financial Times which speaks about the French working with the Germans to revive the economic uh, partnership deal that the European Union uh, agreed with China a few months ago, but which has recently been put in abeyance. Now, I have to say that I think that might be a problematic, because though I think the Germans are keen on this deal, uh, it would still be, I think, difficult to get it through the European Parliament and the European Council, given the predictable opposition of some of the East European states and, of course, the United States itself to this deal. And I think, for the moment at least, that deal has been parked to one side. There is something else the French could do, in theory, which would, I think, create real alarm bells in Washington, and which might indeed attract Washington's notice and even alarm and might force the Americans to start to take steps to try to reassure the French and to try to meet the French halfway. And that has nothing to do with China and it has everything to do with Russia. And here I am referring to, obviously, the European Union's sanctions against Russia, which were related to the Ukraine and Crimea issues. Now, some of these sanctions come up for renewal in a few weeks, and they require unanimity at the level of the European Council in order to be renewed. If the French start dropping hints over the next few weeks, that they might be minded to vote against the renewal of those sanctions. The sanctions will lapse, and at that point, the United States will find itself in a very embarrassing position, both with respect to Ukraine and with respect to some of um, the United States' East European allies, notably Poland and the Baltic states. Of course, were the French to take such a step, it would provoke uproar in countries like Poland and the Baltic states. But I suspect that the French might find 
and probably know they would find, quiet support from some of the South European states, Italy, Spain, Greece and the rest, and there would also be some glimmers of understanding of that decision from Germany, though the Germans would openly criticise it and would say that they didn't support it. Now, the point about Germany is perhaps here an important one, because, of course, the French have actually had to bear a lot of the brunt of the effect of these sanctions. The sanctions which were imposed by the European Union on Russia in 2014 sanctioned various Russian officials and business people and people who were supposedly close to President Putin, as well as various Ru uh, Russian officials at senior levels in the Russian intelligence and military communities. But there were, of course, the far more important sectoral sanctions. And they took three forms. They sanctioned um, the Russian oil and gas industries by withholding some equipment from those industries. There were the very important financial sanctions. And there were also sanctions on dual-use uh, technologies, which the European Union uh, said that it would no longer export to Russia because of the possibility that they might be used in the Russian armaments industries. The by far the most important of these sanctions, by the way, were the financial sanctions. And the Russians have gradually, as I've discussed in many places, found ways around them. And they've now built up their own financial uh, um, industries to the point where they're not as reliant on imports of capital from the European capital markets that they once were. But those sanctions which the European Union imposed, those sectoral sanctions, were carefully calibrated to ensure that there was the least possible damage done to European businesses. What the European Union had not anticipated back in 2014 is that the Rus Russians would impose reciprocal sanctions of their own. And the sanctions which the Russians imposed on the European Union, the reciprocal sanctions the Russians imposed, were bans, prohibitions, an, an import ban on importing European agricultural goods to Russia. And that was a devastating blow for many French farmers, and by the way, for many farmers in Southern Europe. Southern Europe being the main area where the Russians imported food from Europe. And I know this for a fact because I happen to know lots of Greek farmers and Greek agro-businesses which were badly affected by this Russian import ban. But, of course, the bigger devastation, the greater damage, was done to French farmers and French agro-businesses, and that has proved for the French a major problem. Now, one has to be careful here. The economic importance of agriculture to the French economy can be overstated. It is not so very great. But that perhaps underestimates the importance of French farmers in elections and in forming the opinions in France. France, to a certain extent, still preserves more of the sentiments of a rural society than countries like Germany, Britain or the United States do. And so, at least in French self-perception, it is France which has had to bear the biggest and heaviest burden amongst the big European states as a result of the sanctions war with Russia. And this has been, a, you know, a major issue. And on top of that, what the French see is that Germany goes ahead 
and disregards the sanctions and ignores European Union directives and agrees with the Russians to set up big pipeline projects like the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And of course, German businesses and German industries continue to invest heavily in Russia. And in fact, the German-Russian trade relationship currently is thriving. And they see that the United States does pretty much the same thing. The United States is now importing oil from Russia, a fact which is little commented upon. It pursues strategic stability with Russia. But besides, it is now becoming less interested in Russia anyway, because it is refocusing on China instead. And so it's not perhaps entirely surprising that there have been for some time people in France who have been saying to themselves, well, we are carrying the water, we're bearing the burden of this sanctions war, perhaps to a disproportionate degree. At the end of the day, as far as we're concerned, Russia is not a country that we are we conceive of as an enemy. The French don't have the issues with Russia that the British and the Americans have. They were allies in the two world wars. And France, especially during the period of General de Gaulle, had actually a pretty friendly relationship with Russia at that time. So the French are saying to themselves, well, we're carrying the burden of all of these sanctions. And at the same time, we see that the Americans treat us as dirt, as they've just done. So do the British. They also preach at us at all, all, all the time. The Germans preach at us all also, and they are, uh, they've ousted us from leadership of Europe. And on top of all of that, at the same time as they insist that we continue with this sanctions policy over Ukraine, a country with which we have peripheral interests, they're happy to cut deals with the Russians as it suits them. So it's understandable that there is a certain resentment about the sanctions policy in France and that there is a certain feeling in France that the Germans, the British, the Americans don't take France very seriously and that France is paying a price of a policy with respect to Russia with which France fundamentally is not in wholehearted agreement, but it's done it as a loyal Western ally and now it finds that its so-called allies, Germany, Britain, the United States, are walking all over it, treating it like dirt. So the issue is whether French resentments about the treatment they've just received over the AUKUS uh, alliance and the submarine deal with Australia and French resentments about the sanctions are going to come together over the next few weeks, and whether the French will screw up their courage to the sticking point, as Shakespeare might have said, and start dropping hints in over the next few days that they're minded to veto the extension of the sanctions. Now, if they do that, that would be a step worthy of General de Gaulle. It would mean that the Americans, the British, uh, some people in Germany too, the Poles, the Baltic states, I'm not going to even start with the Ukrainians, would become extremely alarmed and angry indeed. You could imagine all sorts of people rushing to Paris to speak to President Macron. You could imagine Secretary Blinken urgently calling Foreign Minister Le Drian to try to persuade him to change his mind. You could imagine also the French being able to leverage that kind of threat to get all kinds of deals done with the Americans. For example, the French might be able, conceivably, to leverage an agreement that France will also be part of AUKUS, which will then become an even bigger, but perhaps a rather more clumsy alliance than it has been at the moment. Something, by the way, which I suspect the British and the uh, Americans might not be too keen on, because, as is fairly well known, there are some people in London 
who have always regarded the French as less than entirely reliable. But anyway, let's put all that to one side. The British and the French actually do cooperate well in defence issues in other respects. So it might be that that might, might work. Well, we will see. We will see whether the French are able to screw up the courage to the sticking point and do that. The alternative they have, of course, is to press on with these claims, these demands for a new European army. But of course, that's not going to lead to anything much and nobody really expects that it will. The big play, the really dramatic play, would be for France to threaten to veto the sanctions. Anyway, that's the big story with France. Now, the point to make about Alcus is that it perhaps highlights something else. And this is what I think the ultimate story of the this row with France is all about. This is that the United States now finds itself committed in two places. It's committed to uh, confront China in the Pacific, and it's committed to confront Russia in Europe. The risk it runs is that as it emphasises one alliance system over the other, it finds that its allies in the other alliance system become upset and alarmed and angry. So we've seen the United States with AUKUS take steps to upgrade its alliance posture in the Pacific, and this is causing outrage and alarm in Europe. And it's important to say that this alarm goes beyond France. In Britain, the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, has now gone around asking whether Britain's involvement in AUKUS means that Britain is now committed to defending Taiwan and going to war with China in the event that there is a conflict over Taiwan. There's a question, by the way, which quite a few people are asking and which I might as well say straight away, if it was answered in the positive, would re receive a very negative response from many British people. There is, in Britain, a constituency, a large body of opinion, which supports a strong line against Russia. China, by contrast, is far away, as far as the British are concerned. A conflict with China is not something that most British people want or are remotely interested in. And that is true in other countries in Europe as well. It's certainly the sentiment in places like Germany and Italy, and to a certain extent, it's also a sentiment, the sentiment in Brussels. And when I talk about Brussels, I mean the entire combine of institutions that exists in Brussels, NATO, the European Union, all of those. From the point of view of the Brussels bureaucracies, a US emphasis on the Pacific downgrades them. It makes them less important. It means that they are losing their position as part of US global policy. And that is deeply alarming. And that makes them wonder about their own long-term future and the future of Europe. And it makes them wonder also about their relationship with Russia. And it goes beyond this. Some of the Baltic states, Lithuania specifically, have taken a very strong line against China and have tried to position themselves as a strong ally of the United States against China. But this isn't actually the attitude or the perspective of most European, uh, most East European states. Ukraine has a good relationship with China. It sells uh, its turbine technology to China, turbine technology it used to sell to Russia, but which Russia no longer buys, or to be more precise, which Ukraine is no longer willing to sell to Russia, sells it instead to China. 
sells some agricultural goods to China, it imports medications from China, and as I discussed in a recent program, it also voted alongside China in a recent vote in the UN Human Rights Council acting against the United States. So Ukraine has no interest in a quarrel with China. Its overriding concern is Russia. And if the United States repositions itself, refocuses on the Pacific, well, that is extremely bad news for Ukraine. And the Ukrainians must be asking themselves, well, the United States has now uh, waived sanctions on Nord Stream 2. It's held, held a summit meeting with President Putin. The summit meeting between our President Zelensky, President Zelensky, and the United States President, President Biden in Washington in August didn't go terribly well. All we got was about $60 million, which we have to spend on Javelin missiles. And that wasn't really a very good or satisfactory summit meeting for us. And on top of that, we see the United States pulling out of places like Afghanistan. So what that tells us is that the United States is losing interest in our part of the world. It's losing interest in our conflict with Russia and in eastern Ukraine. And perhaps that means long term that our position is no longer as stable and as secure with American backing as we thought it might be. And, of course, other countries will feel exactly the same way. The Poles, the Polish government, the current Polish government, has made a massive pitch of, uh, uh, in terms of its confrontation with Russia. At the same time, for all sorts of reasons, it has a very difficult relationship with the leadership of the European Union in Brussels and specifically with Berlin. And what it, it has relied in all these quarrels it's found itself in or has picked with the Russians and with the Europeans, increasingly reliant upon its alliance with the United States. But now what seems to be happening is that the United States is pulling away. And where does that leave Poland? Where, where are the Poles going to go in this situation? Many Poles, or at least those polls aligned with the present government must be increasingly anxious and worried and talking to themselves about the real stability and strength of their relationship with the United States, the extent to which they are important to the United States. Now, all these fears and worries that all of these European countries have at the moment are there. They're growing. They're going to get worse over the next few years. But at the moment, they're manageable. But if the United States continues to focus and develop its uh, alliances in the Pacific and starts to downgrade its reliance, alliances in Europe and, worse still, decides that it needs to do what President Biden was telling President Putin it wanted to do back in April, and at the June summit, which is seek a kind of modus vivendi with Russia in Europe, a modus vivendi which will see inevitably the balance of power in Europe shift quietly and steadily in Russia's favour. Well, for the Europeans, that will be a most alarming development indeed. They're not interested in the conflict with China. They're interested in the conflict with Russia. And at that point, some of them might start to do what the French might conceivably do. They might say, well, since the United States is no longer reliable, maybe the time has come for us to start mending our fences with the other side, talking to the Russians, working towards improving our relations with the Russians in order to scale down this conflict in Europe which has led us into a dead end and which has put us in an increasingly precarious position as the United States distances itself from us. And, of course, the problem is that if the United States then takes action to try to quiet these fears, 
if it then re-emphasises the importance of its alliance with Europe, if it then uh, decides that in order to reassure its European allies, it needs to reinforce its forces in Europe, for example, and tighten up its alliances in Europe, then of course it has the problem, because does it then scale back its alliances in the Pacific, its presence in the Pacific, in which case, of course, the Pacific allies, countries like Japan, Indonesia, the Philippines, Australia even, might also start to say to themselves, well, perhaps the, Europe isn't, the United States isn't really interested in us. They're really interested in Europe instead. Maybe we should go back to what we were doing before, which is trading with the Chinese and maintaining good relations with them, because clearly they are the rising power in our part of the world, and the, China, and the Americans are far away, and their primary interests and concerns are in Europe, and they're not with us. So it's easy to see how, as the United States emphasises one alliance system, it finds that it's running into ever greater problems with the other. So what does the United States do? Well, of course, it could do one of two things. It could, on the one hand, try to reinforce its alliances with both set of allies. And, of course, that is, for the moment, the policy, the overt policy of the Biden-Harris administration. But we are seeing, with this temper tantrum from the French following the announcement of AUKUS and the submarine deal, how extraordinarily difficult that is. And we've also seen how maladroit US diplomacy is and how difficult it is for the United States to try to manage this thing in that sort of way. So you can try to reinforce your alliances in both theatres, but you still might find that an extremely difficult and complicated thing to do. And of course, the risk you run is that you become overextended. Now, I have gone over this in programme after programme on this channel, but I'm going to repeat it again. The Eurasians, the Russians, the Chinese and the, their various allies, and by the way, Iran has now formally joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation, a topic of a future video. The, the, these countries not only possess manufacturing and technological capabilities that can match or perhaps even overmatch the US's own and those of the US's allies, but they also possess interior lines. They can move men and equipment from one part of the Eurasian continent to the other, perhaps faster than the United States can. Now, I say that the United States does have, to a certain extent, control of the world's shipping lanes, but with the Chinese naval build-up in the Pacific, with the Russian submarine challenge in the Atlantic, that might also be extremely difficult to sustain to the same extent for very much longer. So you are at risk of getting overcommitted at finding it extremely difficult, increasingly difficult, to run a confrontation in both parts of the world, both in the Pacific theater and in the European Atlantic theater at one and the same time. But it seems to me that this is the trajectory of policy at the moment. Now, the United States has made, it seems to me, some important strategic decisions over the last few years. These strategic decisions predate the Biden-Harris administration. But it's clear that for some time now, going back to the last years of Barack Obama's administration, the United States decided that China was the primary challenge and that it needed to re-emphasize and pivot towards Asia, pivot towards China, refocus on meeting the challenge from China. But the United States has not been prepared to make the other part of that strategic 
that other part of that strategic set of decisions which it needs to make if it is going to make this system of the Pacific um, successful. It hasn't yet decided what it's going to do about the situation in Europe. There is an enormous amount of unfinished business left over from the disastrous decisions taken by the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations to push NATO and the European Union eastward, disregarding Russian concerns and drifting into a confrontation with Russia in Europe that has already stretched American capabilities and resources in Europe and has left the United States in a confrontation with Russia, which is of peripheral importance to itself. And the United States hasn't yet accepted the logic of its, of its pivot to the Pacific and hasn't accepted, too, that it has to scale down its commitments to Europe in Europe if that is going to be effective and successful. And that means having some very tough discussions with the Europeans, not just with the Russians, but with the Europeans too. It means telling countries like Ukraine and the Baltic states that ultimately the United States is not prepared to go to the extreme lengths that they apparently hope. That it's not prepared to support them in their larger, grander strategic policies. It means telling Ukraine that the United States does, will not support Ukraine's membership of NATO or of the Euro-Atlantic community. It means telling Poland that any ideas of reviving the Rzeczpospolita, which I know some people in, Euro in Poland still think, well, the United States will not support Poland over that. And it might, might also mean telling countries like Germany and France that whilst they may, if they wish, support your EU expansion into Eastern Europe, this is not a strategic priority for the United States. I think these conversations need to be had and they need to be held soon. But um, if they're not, if the United States continues with the kind of secret diplomacy it's engaged with, engaged in over several months with the Australians and the British to form alliances in the Pacific without informing its European allies, then what is going to happen is that its alliances in Europe are going to slowly unravel and fracture. It's always better it seems to me, to talk in straightforward and forthright terms with allies rather in, than in duplicitous and manipulative terms. Failure to do that, as we have seen with France, makes those allies angry and resentful. And instead of strengthening alliances, it weakens them in a way that might act in the end actually prove distracting and get in the way of the greater strategy. Well, we will see what happens over the next few weeks. We will see, first of all, what France does. Will it do? Will it take the ultimate step that I have said, the real step which would really attract American attention, put aside all this nonsense talk about a European ally and threaten to veto the extension of the sanctions against Russia, policy that would be popular in France, which would certainly help Macron's re-election there, and one which would certainly attract the attention of European capitals. Will the French be prepared to do that? And what will the United States do? Will it learn the lesson of the French temp temper tantrum over AUKUS and understand that as it presses ahead with its confrontation with China in the Pacific, it, unless it is careful, unless it speaks to its European allies in straightforward and clear terms, then it risks seeing its alliances in 
uh, Europe gradually wither and unravel. Well, I'm going to say it straightforwardly. I doubt that the French will find the courage to do that. And I doubt that the Americans understand the importance of doing it, or, or, or of talking to the Europeans in the way that I've said. And I would add also that because I suspect that the French will bottle out of the decision to veto or, 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 or of the talk about vetoing sanctions and will press ahead with utopian project projects like a European army instead I expect that that will reinforce the Americans in their complacency and will make them think that they can continue to take their European allies for granted. I think, by the way, that the French, if they miss this opportunity, will create more problems for themselves down the line. But more importantly, I think that that complacency about Europe on the part of the United States is dangerously misplaced and sooner or later if things continue as they are the US will see its alliances fracture. Well we shall see whether I am right but certainly there will be people in Moscow as well as in Beijing who are assessing the situation and analysing it and preparing their moves carefully. Thank you for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes, both on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my friend and colleague, Alex Christoforo. Please also remember to check out Alex's channel. You will find links under this video. Please also do come and join us in our main uh, um, in our other platforms, locals, especially locals, where we now have a thriving community, where all sorts of people comment and uh, publish their own material, and where we ourselves increasingly publish exclusive content. And please also look us up on other platforms too, especially the new free speech platform, SuperU, and of course, other platforms also, platforms like uh, BitChute, Library, Odyssey, and Rumble. Rumble, by the way, now has some kind of alliance or connection with locals and looks like it's going to become a very potent force indeed. And if you want to support us and support this channel, then you can do that via Patreon and Subscribe Star. And you can also, of course, come to our shop, buy the amazing things you will find there our famous magic mugs. Since I've partly been talking about Australia, I have a mug today with the Australian flag, but you will find mugs with many other flags also. Our amazing t-shirts, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. And also, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button, and please always check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me for this program today. I look forward to you joining me in future programs and have a wonderful day until then.